What are the different kind of RVs? RV standing for recreational vehicle. Class A or motorhome. Travel trailer. Fifth wheel. Pop-up. Class C. A toy hauler is a fifth wheel with a big compartment in the back that has a ramp come down or a balcony or porch, whatever you want to call it. Not an RV, a SpaceX hovercraft for transport from South Padre to Boca Chica. Park model, truck camper. There are two kinds of RVs that I couldn't find while making this video. A Super C and a Class B or van. What's up everybody, I'm Justin Green, a certified RV repair tech, and this is RV stuff you should know. Your awning, it's not made for anything but sunshade. Wind, rain, sleet, snow, you name it, can blow that thing or ruin that thing real quick. It's a huge sail, it could fly off the side of your RV. I get repairs all the time from people who tied down their awning and the wind just took it right off from the RV side and their tie downs were just fine. So you do not want your RV awning out unless you are under it. Please keep this in mind. Your lights are DC, which means fuses. So if your ceiling lights and things are not working, you want to look at your fuses, not your breakers. Your breakers are for outlets, things like your microwave, if you have a residential refrigerator, um, any heating elements, things like that that need 120 or AC units. But most of the components in your RV are 12 volts, so check these fuses before you call somebody like me. RV ACs, this is a Coleman brand, so if you have a Dometic, it's still gonna have filters and stuff, you just have to figure out how to change those. So I'm gonna show you how to change a Coleman filter real quick. We're gonna pop this bad boy out. I like to take a butter knife, because it helps get it under here, pull this thing down, slides right out. Now we can clean this filter in our sink, rinse it off, wipe it off, whatever we gotta do to get all that gunk Mine probably hasn't been changed in about a month. I also have pets, so it gets dirty pretty quickly. Clean it, dry it, put it back, and that'll keep your AC running like new. This will help avoid getting expensive mobile repair techs in your RV, RV techs like me. Your black tank, never, ever, ever leave this open. Don't leave it open. Your gray tank, we don't care. You can leave it open or closed. If you want to keep it closed, to help clean out your line or leave it open just so you never have to deal with it. I leave mine open. But your black tank can never be left open. A thing called Poop Mountain could happen to you and it's a huge mess and it's terrible to try to clean it up. What happens is solids get stuck in the line and all the fluid will just keep running out and trickling out until the clog gets so intense that it just makes this awful mountain and nobody wants that. So leave your black tank closed. Today I want to talk about these little rings. Most RVs have them and I see a lot of people online who have no idea why. Most showers are right next to your toilet. So this is to stop your shower head from falling into your toilet and sucking fresh water, the toilet water up into your fresh water tank. So this is a basically a little safety mechanism so you don't end up with uh, yucky water in your water tank because a reverse flow can happen, pressure can change, and things can get sucked up. So this little ring helps you keep fresh water in your tank and not toilet water. Your vent fam. A lot of people don't realize that there is a fuse right here in that little black twisty thing. You twist it off, pops right off, and it's a little fuse. It's not focusing on it, sorry. But you go ahead and check that if your vent fan's not working properly. Make sure that that fuse is good. And here, so you can see a little easier, fuse is right here, and then you have your control settings. But go ahead and check that fuse. Um, might save you a lot of money for a repair. If it's something else, then you know, a professional might have to come and wire it, somebody like me. But check that fuse first. That's the first thing I'm going to look at. And that might save you a lot of money on a tech like me from having to come to your RV. What's up, everybody? Justin Green with Go Green Mobile RV Repair. I'm a certified RV repair tech. And this is RV stuff you should know. Light bulbs. Most of these lights thread off. They actually twist. They're not going to be as easy as this. I pre-twisted this one. But you twist it on off. Cover comes right apart and then you can get the light bulb inside. The problem with my lights is they don't have light bulbs in them, so I have to replace the entire light. In that case, you pull it down. It's a little bit of a pain. Oh, there we go. Comes down, you see he's got these metal flaps right here. See he's got these metal flaps that hold it to the roof. So you just have to pull it down, and if you want to put it back up, hold these flaps to the end, to the back, and push it through the roof, and then they'll be better. So. The truth about RV fuses. Yes, you have fuses right here. But you'll also have fuses behind panels like that sometimes. 
And on travel trailers, you'll have fuses under the frame on the driver's side. You might also find fuses at the battery. And on a fifth wheel, you might have fuses in there as well. If your jacks and things aren't working, look on the ceiling, on the walls, look all over the place. Because in an RV, fuses can be absolutely anywhere. I've found them inside walls if you follow the wires. So do your best, look where you can, because they hide them all over the place. Does your RV water heater look like this with the vent on the right side? The video might be flipped, so it might be on the left right now. But in real world, if this is on the right side, you have a suburban water heater and you need an anode rod. Every year you need to change that anode rod. If you don't, your tank can rust and deteriorate, causing water to leak all over your RV, which costs thousands of dollars worth of damage. I replace multiples of these every year because people don't know about that rod. Their salesman never told them, the manufacturer never warned them. It's in their manual, but they didn't read it. So I want you to know, this is RV stuff you should know, after all, that you need to change that anode rod at least once a year. Leveling jacks, can they hold weight? This one can lift your tires off the ground just fine. Landing gear can also hold the weight of your RV. Leveling jacks on fifth wheels that look like this can also handle the weight. And of course, this can handle the weight of your RV. What cannot hold the weight of an RV are leveling stabilizers like this. Or like this. These are meant to stabilize your RV. You put them just enough pressure to touch the ground and they'll keep your RV from rocking side to side. They are not built to keep the RV, lift the RV up off the ground. But ultimately, but ultimately Sorry. The best thing for you to do is to check your manual. That'll let you know what your stabilizer jacks or stabilizers can handle. Do you have a tankless water heater? If you do, I've got something really stupid, and you're not going to believe me, but check this out. If your tankless water heater is kind of fluctuating in temperature and not really working very well, it's sometimes hot, sometimes cold, it's kind of bouncing in between the two, and I want you to go outside and check your outside shower. See these two little valves right here? Make sure both of those are off completely. Even if there's no water running through it, if it's on, it does something to the pressure of your tankless water heater and it just makes it not work properly. So make sure these valves are off before you call a tech like me, because we're expensive. To drink or not to drink from your RV's water system. First off, if you're hooked up to city water, then really the only thing you have to worry about is a water filter like this. Make sure you change it every three months, at least depending on how bad your water is. And if you plan to drink from your fresh water tank, you need to make sure that you're sanitizing it. They recommend one fourth a cup bleach for every 16 gallons of water in your tank. Fill that water up with the bleach, let it sit for a few hours, maybe overnight, drain it, rinse and repeat. Try to rinse it as much as you can. You don't want that bleach in there when you're drinking it. Also, do this once every month. It's very, very big pain in the butt. I don't even bother doing it because we don't drink from our water tank at all. Are you driving too fast in your RV? Most people don't realize that your travel trailer and your fifth wheel tires are only rated for 60 to 65 miles an hour. You should check with your manufacturer as well as the people who make your tires to know the number for sure. But it is very unsafe to be driving travel trailers and fifth wheels above that speed. Now your motorhomes or class A's are usually rated for 75 miles per hour. Now you again want to check with your manufacturer for the tire and for the RV to make sure it is not safe to be driving these vehicles very fast. For traveling in your RV, have you heard of the rule of threes? Get to where you're going before 3 p.m., only do 300 miles a day, and take a break every three hours when you're traveling. If you do these three things, your RV travel is going to be a lot more enjoyable. It's good to get your circulation going by taking a break every three hours walking. It's good for the heart. It's going to make you feel a lot better. It also makes your travel more enjoyable. You don't feel like you have to rush to the bathroom or do anything like that. You can stop at nice things to see. Also, getting to where you're going before 3 p.m. will help you pick your spot in the daylight, get set up, get more comfortable, and then you can have a nice dinner where you're going. Because traveling in an RV, after all, is all about leisure and having fun and getting out of the rat race. Did you pack your bearings on your RV? Or check your brakes. Now, I'm talking about travel trailers and fifth wheels specifically. You need to be checking your brakes and packing your bearings once every 10,000 miles or at least once a year. So if your RV is sitting in one place for a long time, you still need to do this work. It is very unsafe to not do this, and most RVers don't even know about it. Driving an RV is an extremely unsafe endeavor as it is, so please make sure you're maintaining and taking care of your RV so everybody can be safe on the road.
up everybody i'm getting a lot of questions about wind and safety in your rv if there's a storm there's a simple mathematical equation to help you figure out how much wind the side of your rv can handle it's the square root of 195 times the weight of your rv divided by the length and the width of your rv now the width you have to make sure you're doing you're not including the bottom part where the tires are because you want to do the actual width of the vehicle not the complete height of the vehicle, if that makes sense. Once you get this, you know, it'll give you a number. For example, my RV can handle 115 miles an hour. Now that doesn't include things like flying debris, tornadoes, things like that. You wanna make sure you're not in an RV in any kind of inclement weather with high winds. These walls are not gonna protect you. They're super thin, super fragile. Anything could fly through those walls. It's just extremely dangerous to be in your RV. This is a GFCI. What it does is it works for outlets near a water source, near a sink, near a shower, near whatever that might get wet. And if that outlet gets wet, it'll pop this GFCI. This has multiple outlets after it. So if you have an outlet, uh, a few outlets in your RV not working, but the rest of the electrical system is fine, come check your GFCI. There's a reset button and there's a test button. The test button will make the outlet pop. So now the outlets don't work after the GFI. And then the reset, if I could push it in far enough with my finger, should reset that outlet. So now all the outlets after this outlet will work. So if you're having electrical problems, check your GFCI first. It might save you a lot of money from somebody like me having to come to your RV and fix it. Do you need a surge protector on your RV? My RV specifically comes with a box inside the transfer switch that does this for you. But the transfer switch is very expensive and kind of hard to replace. You need a tech like me to come do it. So I get one of these instead. Now this is going to let me know if there's something wrong with the park power, if I have any issues before I plug my RV in. I just plug this unit in, flip it on, and then I know if the power is good and safe for my RV. Saves me a lot of time and a lot of money. I like these watchdogs. I'll have a link in the description if you'd like to buy one for a 30 amp RV or for a 50 amp like mine. Hot skin. No, don't be perverted. I'm talking about your RV power. If you don't have a proper ground on your RV, this top this top round one being for 50 amp and the top one being for 30 amp, then you could have hot skin. What it means to have hot skin is anything metal in your RV can cause an electric shock. So you need to make sure that your ground is always connected when you have your RV plugged in. If you're adopting to one of those dog bones and you're putting your RV into just a regular 15 amp outlet just to run a few outlets, maybe try to run your AC, which is possible and it is fine, but don't use an extension cord that doesn't have the ground. Again, it can cause a serious electric shock. It sucks. I've gone to customers' RVs who didn't know what was going on and as soon as I touched their RV, I got shocked. It's awful. Is your RV 30 amp or is it 50 amp? The quickest and easy way to tell is your 50 amp cord has four posts, your 30 amp only has three. You can also tell by the inside of your RV at your breaker box. You should have a 30 amp breaker for 30 amp and you should have a 50 amp, sometimes two of them, if you have a 50 amp RV. Your 50 amp RV is actually two 50 amp legs, two 120 legs that come in and you'll see the double 50 amp breaker and it'll split. You'll have breakers that go on either side, or it'll have the two on one side, but you won't have all the breakers on one 50 amp circuit. Is your RV leaking for this simple reason? RV parks have really intense water pressure. It can be up to 120 PSI coming from the source. Your RV can only handle about 65 PSI, so you need to put a water regulator on here. I'm gonna have a water regulator listed in the description below that I recommend. They sell these little adjustable ones and they are absolutely awful, so please don't use those. I'll show a photo of that up here so you see what it looks like. I've had a lot of trouble with these and I've had to replace them multiple times. So just get the one that I have in the link. It'll last a lot longer for you and you shouldn't have any problems. Try this before you pay a tech like me to come search for a leak. Your RV is full of pecs and simple rubber tubing that cannot handle the pressure from a lot of these RV parks. So put on this regulator and it'll save you a lot of problems. Does your RV slides have tracks on the side like this? If so, you have what is called in the RV industry, Schwintec slides. And they are a huge problem. They are usually installed improperly. They jam up, they twist up. There's two separate motors in the top corners. I've got a couple videos I'll put in the description that'll help you learn how to maintain them a little bit better and keep them functioning so you don't end up stranded. Um, there's a couple uh, manual retract options so that I can keep you on the road as well. 
watch those videos. Those will help make sure your Swintech slides go in and out when you need them to. You don't want to be stuck and have to call a tech like me. I get tons of questions about thermostats and what you can put in your RV. No, you cannot put the Google Nest or any other thermostat, whatever you want, from your home into your RV. It has to be a 12-volt thermostat, much like this one. This is the Micro Air. It's a company I'm not associated with in any way. I've just had it in my RV for a few months, and I've been really enjoying it. it. lets you connect with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. I'll have the link in the description if you want to check that out. But yeah, you can't put whatever you want in your RV. You have to make sure it's compatible with your Dometic, Coleman, Furion, whatever kind of AC unit that you have. You have to make sure it's going to work with that. RV converters and inverters, what do they do? So your converter takes 120 AC and turns it into 12 volts, well 13.6 usually, to charge your batteries. Your inverter takes your battery power, your DC batteries, and it turns it into 120 volts AC. So your converter makes DC and your inverter makes AC. Every RV has a converter, but not everyone has an inverter. Your batteries power most of your lights and almost everything in your RV, including the little motors that move your slides and your awning. And your AC power is going to be your outlets and your AC unit and anything with a heating element. My name is Justin Green with Go Green Mobile RV Repair. If this video helped you, please hit like and subscribe. My channel's full of everything you need to know RV. I'm making every videos as often as possible. So please hit like and subscribe. And this is RV stuff you should know.